Back in January of 2016, you might not remember that the Cavaliers fired their head coach. Notable because he'd taken an undermanned team to a six-game finals the year before and had the Cavs in first place at the time. His replacement was Tyron Liu, someone who had never been a head coach before and who miraculously guided the team all the way back from a 3-1 deficit to win the first ever NBA championship for the city of Cleveland. And for two straight years after that, the Cavs got back to the finals only to lose to the more talented Warriors. But considering how quickly the Cavaliers were ready to fire David Blatt despite his success, it should come as no surprise that Tyron Liu only got six games of a rebuilding year before he was fired. Despite their immense success over the past three years, there was always one issue that never went away, only hidden under the immense shadow of LeBron's offensive greatness. And that issue was defense. Even if you factor in the energy LeBron was trying to save on that end, there were continual and consistent breakdowns that the coaching staff should have been able to fix, but couldn't. The first thing that stands out is the Cavs' inability to switch effectively. Watch how J.R. Smith needed to switch onto Baines, but instead decides to stand in the vicinity of his man while Baines stepped into an easy shot. As this screen is slipped, watch Jeff Green just stay with the ball, letting his man cut right to the hoop, and the weak side help rarely rotated in time. Jeff Green and J.R. Smith are both involved in this back screen, and Green assumes the switch, J.R. stays with his man, and it's a layup. The team just never communicated well enough to be a good switching team, despite Lou sticking with this system. Here, J.R. Smith just gets woefully out of position and the team easily backdoors for another layup. Teams that help one pass away are doomed to give up easy three-point shots, and in today's NBA, I'm sure you'll understand why this is death to a defense. Yet, the Cavs continually did this, indicating to me that either the coaches never instructed them to stop it, or they actually encouraged it. The Cavs ranked near the bottom of opponent three-point attempts and field goal percentage consistently throughout Lou's tenure, and it's not hard to see why when they'd have help from a defender when it simply isn't his rotation. Help on a drive should always come from the weak side, and yet the Cavs would not only get out of position one pass away, they'd also allow middle penetration a lot, a double whammy that forces rotations and leads to even more open three-pointers. Coming into this year, with LeBron gone, the coaches had a chance to start fresh and begin the process of fixing these issues, yet the defense continued to make the same exact mistakes over and over. Just look where Love is when he's supposed to be guarding a shooter one pass away. Sexton does the same thing even when Zizic is already in a position to help, giving up another good look for a catch and shoot. On this cross screen, Hood tries to switch, Thompson doesn't want to, Hood then calls for Chetty to switch on to his man, but is stuck in no man's land as they give up an easy alley-oop. Here's more miscommunication as Corver and Sexton just can't get on the same page and the Pacers make them pay with an open layup. Here's another couple of examples of helping one pass away and how easy it is for teams to just pitch the ball to the open man behind the arc and these shots are simply killing the Cavaliers' defense. Even when we see existence of extra energy, it's misplaced, as four players crash into the lane in a wild over-pursuit of the ball, and it leaves a great shooter wide open for the easy three. The season started on a strange note, when both general manager Kobe Altman and Tyron Liu were clear they did not intend to tank, yet they also committed to more playing time for their younger players like Colin Sexton, Chetty Osman, and Ante Zizic. But these two ideas didn't work in tandem. Sexton is clearly not ready for major minutes, Zizic appears even less so, while Chetty is just barely getting comfortable on the floor. If you're really competing for a playoff spot, it makes no sense to leave J.R. Smith and Kyle Kover on the bench. After the first two games, Kobe Altman decided Korver, Smith, and Fry would no longer get minutes at all. 
Not only did this change demoralize the team, as J.R. Smith debated whether he would take a leave of absence, and Korver wouldn't take getting benched lightly, but the team went belly up that night against a weak Atlanta team. The next day, Tyron Lue decided on his own that Korver and Smith would get back in the lineup, defying his own general manager's directive. So not only did Lue put himself in the boiling hot seat, but this plan didn't work. As Smith did not play well at all the next two games, Korver did well in only one, and worst off, the Cavs lost both in convincing fashion. So, Colby Altman was left with a fairly easy decision. Dismiss the coach whose teams had consistently shown no defensive improvement for years with or without LeBron, and who openly defied his orders to play the younger players more. And we don't have too much to worry about Tyron Lue. He can get some much needed rest, knowing $15 million will be deposited into his bank account over the next three years. Plus, he'll get to do as many TV appearances as he feels like until his next job comes along, and it will come along. But that leaves the curious case of Larry Drew, who won't officially take the interim head coach title unless he gets a raise, even though he's not really in any negotiating position to demand that. And the Cavs will undoubtedly tank to get a higher draft pick this year, so watch for their veterans to come on the market and for teams needing one last piece to raid their roster.